uh, first of all, I think that um, wherever people live together in a state, in a territory, they have the choice to settle their differences by means of dialogue or by means of war or civil war. And I prefer, of course, the former. Uh, when it then comes to the question of social dialogue in, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, traditionally it was based on the fact that in Western Europe after 1945 social and welfare state was um, established in order to allow people to have decent livings, not excitingly, but anyhow to be prevented uh, from extreme, extreme poverty and, and uh, social deprivation. Uh, I find historically interesting that the welfare state as such never has been the explicit target of the labor movement. Actually the labor movement was for socialism and what it attained was social and welfare state, which shows that the social and welfare state was a sort of compromise between different class interests. And uh, looking uh, at Europe nowadays, you find that this class compromise uh, is questioned and actually is destroyed now by the ruling classes, by the elites, may it be uh, the managements, the CEOs of the transnational companies, uh, may it be the uh, elites of the European Union, but also uh, by the head of the states and the governments in the member countries of the European Union. And this means uh, that people who want to keep their living standards and want to protect uh, uh, social and welfare systems and public services from being demantled have to resist. And I think that we are now in Europe in a situation where a power struggle is on the way between two logics. The one logic is expressed quite clearly, frankly, bluntly by the advocates of neoliberalism saying that labor, meaning human beings who have to make their living out of um, uh, their uh, own labor, should be as much reduced in order to uh, maximize profits, while on the other hand, the vast majority of the populations um, insist on their right to send their, people to, their, their, their children to schools, to uh, have access to healthcare system, to have um, unemployment uh, compensations, uh, to have social security and so on and so forth. And I am afraid that the ruling class has decided to leave the table of the social dialogue and now wants to see a power struggle because they hope to prevail and I think they are wrong. They will not prevail because the European populations will not allow these social destructions, which is now part of the austerity packages, which is part of the fiscal pact of the European Union and so on and so forth. And uh, lastly, uh, the European states in generally or in the average, um, collect about 40% of the gross national products um, by taxes. And it's the question, who pays the taxes? You can have taxes on goods of daily life, you, have, you can have taxes on low incomes, or you can have taxes on financial transactions, on wealth, on big incomes, on managerial incomes, and um, as the overaccumulation of capital, meaning the unfair and unequal distribution of the income is one of the main causes of the crisis, uh, I think it's very urgently required uh, to change the tax systems in order to collect the money where it actually is, namely um, in the balance sheets of the big financial uh, actors. And in order to do so, we need a, a, a European frame because we have to shut, shut down tax havens, we have to control capital outflows and inflows, and all this requires a change of the policy of the European Union as well as of the member states of the European Union.
uh, I always say that uh, what counts in ideological questions is not the identity, what counts is the difference. Meaning, um, as uh, the European societies are class divided, uh, you have uh, uh, not one ideology, and if one ideology uh, pretends to become a sort of identity, it then wants to be hegemonic. And the ideology of the ruling class nowadays has not so much to do with the Charter of Human Rights, look at the immigration laws and how they treat people who come from Africa to Italy, for example, by boats. It has not uh, so much to do with uh, humanism. Uh, look how the austerity programs now work, that people in Greek, that the children in Greek schools um, have to be there hungry and they don't have milk and, and, and elementary um, uh, food supply is not guaranteed. No, uh, that ideology which they want to make the European identity is the neoliberal idea that humans have to compete and that Europe has to be strong enough to control a large part of the world in order to extract resources, oil, gas, rare uh, sands and so on and so forth. And with this identity we have to disagree. So I believe very much that uh, it's necessary to talk on this difference and to make the own position clear, namely we want another Europe which is in sharp contradiction to that what is now suggested as being the European uh, identity. a very challenging uh, question uh, because the relation between diversity and hegemony is, is pretty complicated. Firstly, I would say that hegemony cannot be otherwise thought than as a common. It does not belong to a party, it does not belong to a, a single trade union, it does not belong to a particular movement. Uh, it consists of diversity, but uh, as uh, change in uh, real life uh, requires also power, uh, the practical test of hegemony uh, lies at least partially in the capacity to articulate the diverse interests and ideas into a joint strategy and this requires much knowledge, much culture, uh, it requires being attentive to different point of views and it requires of course flexibility and, and, and tolerance. Uh, what's the place of Marxism in it? A simple reading of Marxism suggested that Marxism describes reality and as it describes reality or as it reflects reality it is true and as it's true it's almighty. But this of course is naive. I would say that Marxism uh, should develop as a language which is capable to connect these different interest groups, meaning it's about translation. And by the way, this is, uh, this is the reading of Marxism which is very close to that what Antonio Gramsci said, because he said that Marxism is that ideology which is capable to translate different social experiences into a common political practice. And in that sense, uh, I think uh, Marxism is required, but a, a new Marxism or maybe also an old Marxism, if you go back to that what Marx originally intended with, with his writings, we have to overcome all this sort of dogmatism, authoritarianism and so on and so forth, and being able to encompass the knowledge which is available, which is available now. And uh, finally, uh, Marxism leads to class analysis, but if you read the, the 
early writing of Marx, you will find that he, he, he was uh, describing the proletariat as a sort of, a, of an empty signifier, meaning that uh, in each, that means that in each historical period it has to be uh, constructed what the opponent of the ruling system actually is, who is belonging to it, uh, which social strata play a role, which ideologies uh, can be articulated, and in this sense, I, I very much strong class analysis, namely the understanding that the oppressed in a given society and in different uh, national spaces are united by a common interest, and this interest they have to construct. It is not a precondition, but is a result. It is a result of the political process. This is my reading of class analysis, and I think it's more required than ever in human history. Yes, and a good example for it is, is of course, feminism, uh, because in, when Marx wrote his Capital, he was completely ignorant to the fact that in the r reproduction um, of the labor force, uh, not only an unpaid but also an invisible um, human labor is integrated, namely the, the, the labor of women. And if I once made the experiment to uh, look how uh, the rate of added value and the rate of profit would change according integrating the unpaid, invisible uh, 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 labor of women. And you can do it in different ways. You can, as it is unpaid, you can say it's part of the profit, or you can say as it is part of, as it is part of, of the reproduction of the labor force, it's part of the variable capital. And in a real society, uh, it's a mixture of both. But this means, as it is a mixture of both, it must be explained as a tacit compromise between the working class and the capital, not to talk about the unpaid labor force of the women. And having this in account, uh, it's easily to be understood why feminists insist on their own political structures, on developing their own theory of liberation, and class consciousness in a Marxist sense, is simply to, under, to admit this fact that the world from the point of view of the women looks differently from the world from the point of view of those men who tacitly agreed with the ruling class that we don't talk about the, the, the work of women. Unlikely to uh, uh, the majority of my comrades and friends, uh, I appreciate Michael Hart's uh, works. Um, although it turned out that the notion of uh, multitude is awkward and could not be could not become um, uh, a, signifi a signifier for uh, the articulation of many people. So in this sense, he. He, he shares the destiny of, of many other authors who had good ideas, but when uh, they were not, they, they did not develop the capacity to be translated into real mass practices. But uh, I, I, I think that his idea that the proletariat today uh, has to do with informational work immaterial goods uh, is uh, diverse in, 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 in terms and has to be, so to say, composed. This is a, a correct idea and I would love the official Marxists to work systematically on this and maybe to invent then a more appropriate and a more popular term as uh, multitude.